Hello and welcome to another episode of Having a Chat. My name is Tommy Kasher and today I'm chatting with Kate Maloney. Hey Tommy, very excited to be on and chatting with you. Mate, how are you? So just a little, I'll give you know people a bit of an intro for you. Co-captain of the Melbourne Vixens for 2020 and Kate, you're joining me from your 14 day quarantine with the Diamonds Camp over in New Zealand ahead of next month's Constellation Cup. How the bloody hell are you? <laughs> I'm good. This is one of the most exciting things to happen, though, because usually I'm in my room or, you know, we get the option at the moment to go out and do one session a day. So to come on here and chat to you, Tommy, very excited. Quarantine is going well, um, well, as well as quarantine can go, but we know we're in a unique position to be here and we're excited. So you mentioned that you can do one session a day because I was reading um, an article on the ABC website that said when you were going over there, it was like a, a mandated quarantine facility. It's not just, obviously, uh, we're recording this via Zoom and I can see that you look like you're in a hotel room. So you are allowed out though because I have seen some content on the Diamonds and all the, all the players' Instagram that you're out doing a session a day. Yeah, so we're in managed quarantine at the moment and obviously because we are preparing for a Constellation Cup, it might be a little bit different to some quarantines. But um, at the first few days, we couldn't leave our room. So it was all bike sessions in our room or Zoom um, strength sessions and stuff like that. But sort of once we moved on, you got your COVID test results, you then relate, were able to leave to go to, we have a gym on site here, so we can go down there. Um, and then we had another test this morning, which for all those who have had their COVID tests, I've had lots now, I'm an expert. Um, <laughs> we, after our day six test results, uh, assuming they all come in negative again, uh, we will actually be allowed to leave and head to a court as of Monday. So okay. um, yeah, we've sort of been in increments where we've slowly, we were stuck in our room and then we've slowly been able to get out to do a session. Um, might be able to go out to do a walk, but uh, yeah, hopefully as of Monday, we can hit the court and start preparing um, for that first game. So is the gym in like within the hotel facility? Like, you know, you just go up an elevator to a certain level in the gyms there where you're working out or is that like outside and you're allowed to go out there? Yeah. So to sort of give you a visual, so you're at a hotel and there's a car park, they've got like a marquee set up and inside that um, they've got some gym equipment. So oh, cool. um, it's on site at the hotel, no elevators because you couldn't do that. And, you know, every time we enter a stairwell, they'll have to clean it um, before anyone yeah, else. Wow. Can. So it's very um, strategic in how it's all done and when you're allowed out. But the Australian cricket team is here at the moment as well. So there's lots of, you know, someone goes through a stairwell, clean it, then the other group can go through. So you sort of become like a bubble within your group. Where, so did you have to quarantine for a certain amount of time when you went up to Brisbane last year for the Super Nepal bubble. How long did you have to quarantine for up there? Yeah, so that was 14 days and that was a little bit different. Um, so we were allowed to leave as of day one to train once a day when we were in Brisbane, but we weren't allowed to go out to fresh air and, and walk around for like, we might have like 45 minutes a day here or two blocks of that. Whereas when we were in Brisbane last time, we didn't have that. So this is probably a, a bit more strict than what we had when we're in Brisbane, but then there are some things that are a little bit different as well. So different sorts of quarantines, um, but yeah, I suppose as a Melbourne team, um, some of our girls are a bit more used to it than say others that haven't had to do it yet, or I think Perth have done it as well. So how are you going with the quarantine? Like obviously you're out doing your session for what, an hour, hour and a half a day? Yeah, so going and leaving to do a training session is like the most exciting part of the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, other than the three meals that come to your door when you get a knock. So they're probably the best things. But the, the great thing is um, our program has meant that we've been really busy throughout the day. So even before we were allowed out, you know, you might have a session in the morning, um, have a bit of a break and then do a session in the afternoon. Now that we can leave, um, as I said, super exciting for us to be able to get outside and, and do a session and be together as a group because we haven't had a lot of time um, together but um, it is probably the most exciting part of the day which is good. How do you feel that's going to impact the team? You mentioned that you haven't had a whole lot of time together like you, you sort of got together as a group you had the camp, three-day camp and then you've come over but you've come over and you're all separate in your room like you, you haven't been able to gel as you normally would when you go away as a group. Yeah I think it's a great challenge for us um, 
you know, we had some time together straight after SSN when we went to Noosa and that was more of a bonding type camp. And then we headed to Sydney for about 72 hours before we went to New Zealand as well. So we got to get out on court, but we've been able to stay in um, contact over Zooms throughout that period between SSN and now. I think one of the great things being involved in the SSN competition is we've seen that clubs can do it. You can go into quarantine, you can manage that. And we've got the best people around us to make sure that we're ready to go. And I think the girls are just excited about the challenge of, um, you know, something different, embracing that and hopefully being able to get out on court and really show everyone what we can do. So are you binge watching anything on Netflix at the moment when you've got all this spare time in quarantine? <laughs> um, the Australian Open has kept me uh, going. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm going to do once the Australian Open is finished, but some girls have been watching The Undoing. I'm not sure if you've heard No, heard I'm not that. across that. I might get onto that. I also haven't watched Bridgerton yet, so I've got a few okay. things <laughs> yeah, that yeah. I can do to keep me busy. But honestly, um, I thought I'd have so much downtime to do that, but that we've had a really great balance of training and a few breaks. And as I said, the Australian Open, I love the tennis, obviously from Melbourne. So always get around the Australian Open and, and that's kept us busy and something to chat about as well. Mate, because normally you and the girls would be down there in the marquees and, you know, getting snapped <laughs> a bit differently. I <laughs> but I do, I love the tennis. I wish I was in Melbourne and could go and it's great just to see that live sports back in Australia and back in Melbourne and people are able to go and watch and we're excited to be able to get out in front of fans in New Zealand and and play against one of our biggest rivals. Well I've been keeping up to date with Twitter and I've noticed that the netball community over Twitter is going nuts that the Vitality Super League has kicked back and then um, I think a few people have done that thing where you can um, log on through a VPN and change your like internet browser and watch UK stuff over there so I know that you know netball being back on TV is a huge thing for the netball community and it's great that the diamonds matches will be on free to air TV so channel 9 and 9 gem I think that the games will be on which is really exciting but mate normally the first question I uh, I kick off with uh, what do you have for breakfast <laughs> You know what? We've been really lucky. The food here has been amazing. So thanks to our dietitian for sorting that all out. But I'm a wheat bix girl, and really, how many uh, do you normally do? <laughs> I usually have three wheat bix. Okay. Uh, and but you know what? The great thing about this is in the morning we get this sheet and you circle what you want. And for breakfast, there's so many different options. I'm circling poached eggs and sourdough, and um, I've got so much time on my hands, but um, yeah, it's been good. The menu's been great. We've been really lucky in, in that it, um, the food has been really good for us. So take me through, like, is a nor three wheat bix a normal breakfast for you, like in season when you're going through with the Vixens before an early morning weight session? Is that what you generally... Like, yeah, a big meal prepper? What, depending on what I'm doing, like, if we're back at home and we've got an early running session, I'm probably not going to have wheat bix and milk. Probably yeah. go something... <laughs> Yeah, in my stomach, it might be toast and Vegemite or something like that. I'm sounding really Australian here. <laughs> you really are. Um, but no, I am a big sucker for um, poached eggs, avocado on toast. It's one yeah, of my okay. um, staples. So I do get around that. And, and it is for us, um, I suppose, it's all about fueling for your training session. So depending on what training session I have, depending on the protein carb, making sure that I'm eating the right things to recover. So, um, you know, if I'm hungry, I'll have more wheat bix than three as well. Tommy, how many wheat bix do you have? Uh, I would normally go three and then a cut up banana on top as well. Yeah, banana. You've got to go banana. Yeah, get your fruit intake as well. <laughs> uh, something I'm fascinated by, because I obviously previously worked at the Vixen, so I saw you girls up close at training and how impressive you are as athletes. Do you let yourself... I guess, enjoy your food and do you have a, a cheat meal here and there or, you know, do you have like a little piece of dark chocolate every night to get that binge in there or are you really strict with your food? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things is just about enjoying your food. I'm really a basic eater in a sense of just trying to eat as much fresh food as I possibly can. But don't get me wrong, chocolate is one of my biggest weaknesses. I love chocolate and there's nothing I enjoy more than um, you know, a post-game meal and treating myself after a game. And it usually tastes a whole lot nicer after a win as well. So um, <laughs> try and get that first and then treat myself to something. I am, But yeah, chocolate is definitely a weakness of mine. So I do enjoy a bit of chocolate. 
Okay, so if you're in the um, chocolate aisle at Coles and you're standing in front of like the Cadbury blocks, which yeah. block are you going with? Like you can only have like, one. What's your go-to? I feel like I'm going to get really judged right now. Good, good. <laughs> I like where this is going. I know. I'm going to sound really old, but I do Oh, don't say fruit and nut. Fruit and nut. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Mate. Not fruit and I do want to say it for that exact reason. I always get judged. I shared a room uh, in the hub with Liz Watson and we'd always, when we went to the supermarket, we'd go and get ourselves a treat and um, she'd go, you know, the cool, marvellous creation. <laughs> yeah. I'd go and get my fruit and nut and I always got teased for that. So at least no one wants to eat your chocolate when you have fruit and nut. Oh, when smart. When you have kisses. So Joe and Emily would come over sometimes and no one wants the fruit and nut. <laughs> that's actually a good little insight. Find something that's niche that no one else wants. Yeah. But okay. I, I, look, I am open to pretty much all <laughs> chocolate. Other but, than Turkish Delight. Yeah, Turkish Delight's rubbish. Especially in the favourites boxes. I feel like the Turkish Delight is always the one that gets left. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so how are you feeling about the upcoming series? the Constellation Cup against New Zealand. Yeah, super excited. You know, um, it's been a long time since the Diamonds have played a test match and we haven't been together a whole lot in the past 12 months. So to get together as a group and to know that we, we're super lucky to be here in New Zealand, you know, there's a lot of people that um, can't get around and travel at the moment and it's a really unique opportunity for us and we're not taking it for granted we can't wait to get out on court and as I said earlier play against one of our biggest rivals in New Zealand and we know it's going to be tough um, but yeah we're prepared we're preparing as best as we can and uh, just super excited to get out on court. So do you feel like this could be a bit of a changing of the guard in a sense for the Diamonds given that the shooting end is so different to where we've been before. Obviously, Caitlin Thwaites recently retired. Steph Wood injured. Gretel Tippett. Is it Boeta? Is that how we say her? Yeah. yeah. Gretel yeah. Uh, on maternity leave. And then in the squad, we've got Cara Conan, Sophie Garvin, and Kira Austin. So none of those three girls have actually made their diamond debut yet. We've got Caitlin Bassett, obviously, the legend in the, in the goal shooter position. But what are your thoughts on, on the shooting end? Yeah, well, I think it's so exciting. We've got um, so many new players into our squad. Amazing SSN seasons. And I think what we're going to see this series is um, some new Australian talent that we might not have seen on the international stage before. And, um, you know, they've been in our scene for a long time, whether that's in underage programs, Aussie A programs, but out on the SSN court. And um, I think that they're just ready to grab their opportunity and how exciting for them to get this. And, hopefully, um, yeah, put some really good games out on court. I know I can't wait to see what they can do because I think we've got so much depth in Australia and we've got some young girls coming into this squad who I think can do amazing things, not this series, but hopefully going into the future as well. How do you think the, um, I guess, two-point rule changed? Did it change the way... Obviously, it changed on the eve of the season, right? But did it, from your perspective as a mid-quarter, did it change the way you were setting up or you had to help out the defenders or attackers in the, the last five minutes? I actually completely forgot about the two-point shot until you brought it up. <laughs> I've been so focused on this series and it, it doesn't exist here. But um, to be honest, we were probably a team that sort of decided that with the Vixens that we were just going to play normal. If the goal has got in a two-point shot and they felt comfortable and wanted to take it, they would. And I thought... Our goalers did an amazing job of that. Um, as a mid-quarter, I suppose it changes a little bit tactically depending on how close the game is. Um, if you're down, you need to get up, whether you're going to try and feed a goaler in that range. Um, but it probably was left mainly up to our shooters and how they felt. I think defensively is more the key because in that last five minutes, um, it was nearly like you needed to lift that defensive intensity. You had to help. Um, the defenders in the circle as much as you can not allow an easy circle edge feed in because it makes it really easy as middies if we can get to that circle edge and give the ball to our shooters where we want. It's going to sound stupid, but it was, it's almost a kind of going in your favour if you left someone by the post and they could only, you know, shoot from straight under the post and for one point then feeding off the circle edge for two. 
Yeah, I would have hated to be a goal defence or goalkeeper. Yeah. I honestly think they were probably affected the most in that. Like, the mindset of do you allow your shooter to take a one or do you push them into that two-point zone if that's not where they're comfortable? But I think I'm lucky as a midi. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching games it was in. I thought it was exciting. I probably wasn't at the start of the season. I was like, oh, I don't know about this rule, but watching games where it did impact it, it did make it exciting in that last five minutes. Yeah, and it um, brought the atmosphere up. Hey, like I can sure. only imagine in the, co- in the stadium. Yeah, and I suppose it's easy for me to say because I'm not a shooter and I don't have to <laughs> take the shot. Uh, and I'm not a defender in the circle as well. So, um, but I did think watching it on TV, I thought it was exciting to watch. And I know I definitely felt like in that last five minutes, you sort of got into the game even more. So, um, as a player, uh, I enjoyed it. I didn't find that it affected our game plan much at all. Um, but I thought from a viewing point of view, it, it did bring that excitement. Now, I don't want you to heap pressure on anyone, but out of Cara Cohn and Sophie Garvin and Kira Austin, who do you think we're all going to be talking about after the <laughs> Diamond Series, that they had a great series, you know, they're the next Diamond, you know, they're going to play 50 tests. Who do you reckon the one that we're going to be talking about after the series is? Has anyone, you know... That been... is a tough question. <laughs> Well, that's You've why I get on the spot here, but uh, honestly, from what I've seen in SSN, I think hopefully after this series, we're going to be talking about all three of them because I think very um, diplomatic, yeah, Kate. I know <laughs> they're three amazing players, and, and I've been really lucky um, throughout Australian A programs to play with the three of them. And I know I walked away from that series just thinking, wow, these girls are going to have massive careers with the Diamonds, and um, I come into this camp thinking the same thing. So I. I, you know, I, I'm sure they'll get opportunities and it, it's going to be which one can grab it with both hands and really make it their own. And I'm excited to see what they can do. Because Kira's quite versatile, Kira Austin, isn't she? Because she's been playing goal attack and wing attack a bit for the Giants. Yeah, she's been playing across both positions. And I think that's the key there. The three or, and with Bass, the four of them, um, or is that five? I can't do the maths, Tommy. Well, well um, then, that's four, but then Tippard. Dwan, Dwan. There as well. Yeah, yep. and they're just, the five of them are completely different. And yeah. I think that what's going to be so great for the Diamonds is we've got five goalers with us who, who are extremely different. And that makes it tough um, to defend against, you know, if you can have those changes and make them seamless. And um, I think they've all got such different strengths. And, um, yeah, looking forward to seeing them out on court. Mate, you've given me a bit there without actually giving a specific answer, so I'm glad. I'm glad we got. I'm glad we got there. Don't want to put you under too much pressure, um, mate. I want to talk about the new broadcast rights deal for 2022 because obviously we're in the last year of the deal with uh, Channel Nine and Telstra, and then next year it goes to Foxtel and Ko. As a you know current co-captain of the reigning premiers, what's your take on it? Like how? Are you involved in any of those conversations from like higher levels or do you just kind of see what you see in the media? Yeah, to be honest, you you hear rumours and and there are chats, but a lot of it, I probably don't know it um, in depth enough to have a huge say at the moment. And and I do want to learn more, but I think um, from what I've heard, but it's going to be really exciting for netball. You know, we have been trying to grow our sport year on year. Um, I think we took massive steps in 2017 when we signed with Channel 9 and the competition changed. And, you know, we've got another exciting step forward now, heading with Fox and KO. And Channel 9 have been amazing in growing our sport and bringing it to the level. And hopefully Fox and KO can do the exact same thing, take us to another level. Because, you know, when I started this in SSN and or in ANZ at the time, nine years ago, where our sport started then and where it is now, the steps that we've taken have been huge. And... Um, I think, you know, the more money that we can get coming into our sport, the more professional our athletes can be. And, you know, we want to see women's sport, not just netball, women's sport in general. We want athletes to be fully professional athletes. And um, hopefully this is another step forward for us. And I think the more we can grow it at the top end, the more we can develop at grassroots as well. And, um, yeah, hopefully with KO and Fox, we can get a whole – we can keep – our netball viewers, but we can get even more people that maybe aren't watching it because, you know, we want to, uh, we want people to turn netball on and uh, see it for the amazing athletes that we have and the great sport that it is. How far realistically do you think 
netball is away from becoming full-time professional for athletes like yourself who are in the SSN programs? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I wish I had the, yeah. the answer for you. Um, I think what I've seen over the last couple of years is, is really big steps towards that. You know, we have girls that, yeah, are still studying and that are on rookie contracts. I think the biggest problem with our sport is probably the difference between our top players and our rookie players. We need this, the rookie rage um, to continue to grow. And that doesn't mean bringing them together, but it means lifting from the top to the bottom. And um, we want girls, yes, to have that amazing balance in life and sport, but to give people the option to be fully professional athletes as well. And I think, you know, I love, I'm really passionate about women's sport and seeing the competition that we now have with cricket and AFL and soccer, I think that that just enables um, the competitiveness. You know, we want to stay at the top. We want to be, um, you know, the most professional women's sport. And I think having this competition just enables us to keep growing as well. Can you talk a bit about what your uh, program looks like at the Vixens? So for those who might not be aware, what does it look like to play for the Vixens but technically not be a full-time athlete because um, you and I both know who have been, I mean, I saw the amount of hours you girls put in. And to me, it's like, well, what more could you be doing to actually be full-time? So can you just mention like, you know, a normal week, what it looks like at the Vixens, what hours you're at training? Yeah, I think um, every club would be super different um, in pre-season at the moment so on a Monday morning we'll head in and we'll train from about seven till eight we'll have a conditioning session on the track have about an hour break and we'll come back from nine till ten thirty and do a um, gym session and then have a bit of a break in the Arvo and we head to court in the afternoon so you're thinking wow Monday's big we've got three sessions not every day is like that yeah. um, we then have Tuesday which is a court session so you be on court for maybe two hours but there's probably like an hour before and a bit of time after as well that you're there um wednesday is in the morning so i have two sessions in the morning conditioning and weights thursday back on court friday we'll do conditioning and weights again so usually we have one or two sessions a day sometimes three um but sort of having mainly working in either the mornings or the afternoon so that does enable girls to either study um, or do a little bit of work as well. And I think um, netball's been great at encouraging people to get out there, to continue to study, and continue to work and to grow outside of netball because we know as athletes that, you know, we can only play for so long and um, we need to make sure that we're really well-rounded people as well. Obviously, it's great that netball allows you to do that, but can you realistically fit anything else in your schedule when you've only got like a few hours free and and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to have a dig at the sport of netball, right? I just think you're so close. And I just hope that this can be because the, I'm just so impressed that the level that you girls get to with only being part-time or, or not full-time, whatever we, whatever we want to call it. But I'm so excited to see where the sport goes when you are full-time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a really tough question because, you know, we do have some girls who may not work as much or you do have girls who do need to study and, and work a little bit more. And, and you're right, it's kind of when do you take that next step forward where you're, you know, you look at an AFL club and, and they're there all day. Do we yeah. want to do that? Do we? I suppose we need to work out as a sport what does professional look like because it's going to be really different for a lot of people. Um, is it that you are, do you go to training and you stay there all day like an AFL club or um, do we see, you know, you can get that professional wage but still have sessions throughout your day and still enable girls to go out and, and study and um, work and do other things in their life as well. So I think the sport of netball really does need to sit down and, and work work out well what does professional look like and then how are we going to get there and it's about taking those steps to get there and um yeah I think we're growing as uh women's sport is growing but we're still we are a long way off still and it's um really important that we can get um tv deals that we can get people 
after games and um, people switching on TVs and watching it, you know, that's the biggest thing for us. Bums on seats, people watching the TV and that's how our sport's going to grow. And I know the athletes will do everything in their power to make sure that they keep in Improving, taking those next steps and now we need um, the sport uh, support from outside of that as well. Are you excited to be a leader in the sport at the moment when there is so much room to grow and you're sort of you know paving the way for those next generation of netballs to come and you can hopefully lead the sport in a better place for them? Yeah I'm so excited you know um, I'm really passionate about women's sport and I love going out into the community and and meeting young netballers and it puts a smile on my face because I look at them and think, wow, hopefully when you're playing at this level that you will be fully professional and that you're going to have, you know, the experiences that I've got to have and um, the memories that I've got to have as well because I feel like one of the luckiest people in the world, you know, I get to do what I love every single day um, with some of my best mates and Um, yeah I love that and I can't wait to see the next generation of netballers who will hopefully be fully professional and anything any input that I can have into helping our sport grow um, yeah I I want to put my hand up and be involved in. So you mentioned that you get to do what you love every day with your mates 2020 was an amazing season for the Vixens what does it mean to you? Yeah it was so special um you know, 2020 going into the season, we didn't know if we were going to be able to play. And um, I remember being on Zooms uh, about Victoria going, well, we, the season just kept getting pushed back and we were going to Sydney and then we are going to Brisbane. And, um, you know, I know our girls put their hand up and said that they wanted to do anything that they could to make sure that our competition got to play because that was so important for the longevity of our sport. And, and to keep growing in that professionalism as well. And um, to, I think, get to the airport with the girls and get on the plane and know that we did all put our hand up to do it and and take that leap. And um, Simone, from the very start, said to us that, you know, why not us? (laughs) We've probably, us and Magpies probably had it the toughest in terms of lockdowns and um, leaving and quarantining at the start. And... She said, why not us the whole time? And we sort of had that mindset and to go away as a team um, for, I think we were away for over a hundred days to live with each other. um, I think it was a real positive for us. Um, We became closer as a group. Um, We learnt so much about each other on and off the court. And I think on the court, um, we saw some real growth within our group and to be able to achieve that ultimate success, I always say, Everyone always says, why do you play netball? And, I, you know, one of my answers are there's no better feeling um, than working really hard with a group of people who become like your family and to uh, achieve that ultimate success. Um, it's pretty special. And um, we were able to do that this year. And, you know, I was lucky enough in 2014 to be a part of the Vixens Premiership. And uh, it took me another six years to win one. And they're not easy to win. And, um, it's pretty special when you do get to have that. So, um, yeah, it was a special year and hopefully, um, yeah, we can continue to grow as a team as well. Were there tough moments that you had in the bubble up in Brisbane, like 100 days away from family and friends? How, how was your mental health during that side? Were there Were there days where you were struggling a lot or were you kind of just laser focused on your job and what you girls were there for? Yeah, you know, I think it was definitely tough and people had their moments, but um, overall, we loved the experience and we knew that uh, coming from Victoria that we were super lucky to be there and, and to be playing netball because community sport back home, they weren't, girls weren't playing netball um, and or playing sport in general. And I think for us, it was knowing how lucky we were to be there, um, that we did have a job to do and... Uh, yeah, we were able to stay focused and and continue to build on that. But don't get me wrong, I think there would have been times where it was tough for a lot of girls being away from home for so long. But I think the way that they were able to cope with it um, and then to be able to perform on the weekend was awesome. Did you implement any 
um, cool things as a team, like, you know, any team movie nights or bonding nights? Like, are there any cool things you can share with us that help you girls get through the hub and, like, team bonding things that brought you closer together? Yeah, I feel like there would have been so many different things um, that we did across the time. But, you know, being in Brisbane, we were lucky enough to do road trips uh, to the beach, which was nice. So we did that on our days off. Um, Tegan Phillip one night, uh, her husband is from India. So um, we'd have like little Indian cookups and stuff like that. But just, I think, hanging out together um, away from the court, you know, you learn and live it. You know what it's like living with people. You learn so many different things about them that you just would never have learned if um, we didn't have that experience. So, um, yeah, we did lots of fun little things and um, learned a lot about each other and it was good fun. So you were rooming with Liz for the entire time? Yeah. Is that, Matt, have you got any dirt on Liz as a roommate? Is she really dirty? Is she really messy? Or is she, is she good? Liz is pretty good. Um, we had Joe and Emily across the road from us and Kate, Eddie and Taylor just down the corridor. But Liz, I think, tactically hurt her ankle so that I had to cook and clean for the majority <laughs> oh. of the trip. And she would always plan her physio appointments at about 6pm. <laughs> um, so I up. was on cooking and cleaning duties a lot of the time. Uh, but nah, Lizzie and I are super close. So she's super easy to room with. Um, yeah. Joey, Joey and Emily, Emily was the cook in that. I think what people... Uh, worked out well what people's strengths and weaknesses pretty quickly and um, but we try and jump around to people's rooms and have yeah. dinner and stuff like that so you might taco Tuesday or whatever it might be. What are your skills like in the kitchen? Yeah not great um, but <laughs> literally I just the same um, pretty basic cook. Um, You've got some recipes from Liz's Nonna Centre. Well I was cooking the pasta. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. So, because we played so often, we were playing two games a yeah, week. Yeah, true. Um, it was literally like meal, pre-game meal, post-game meal, meal, pre-game meal, post-game meal. So it was like Liz and I probably had about three meals on rotation for about four weeks. Um, but no, it was good. Yeah, I, I joke around. She cooked occasionally. <laughs> Don't try and make up for it now. She didn't cook. She was the worst one. Going to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, I don't want to be controversial here, right? But since SSN started, the Vixens were talked up as, you know, each year you were one of the favourites. You were one of the teams that, you know, people predicted to go quite deep in the finals. Do you think after last year, there was a sense of, I don't know if relief is the right word, but like you girls as a team had lived up to or got to the level where you all expected yourself? Because I know that Simone expects a lot of you and internally, you all expect a lot of yourselves as well. Yeah, I think being a part of um, the Victorian netball pathway and, you know, the rich history that Victorian netball has is that you have a high expectation on yourself. You expect to um, be at the top every single year. And I think you say that we had high expectations on us from early on, but I, I think in 2017, actually, no one really thought too much of us we lost a lot of players and and we had a good season up until the finals and I think that was when the expectations jumped on us because people had seen what we could do and um we didn't we did underachieve for a couple of years there and I think we always knew in our group that we had it and it was just about being able to get out on court and perform and um I think the biggest growth for us this year was definitely um, being able to be on court, change things up in the time. I think just the maturity of our group changed so much. We had great depth within our squad, especially in that goaling circle. Um, but overall, we were able to carry 14 players with us. And I think all 14 had a really big impact. And um, I think, yeah, just that cohesion, but also just the smarts out on court were a lot better this year. How happy are you for girls like Elle McDonald and Jackie Newton who, you know, basically got added to the squad because there was an extended bench from three to five. They showed their stuff during the season and now 
you know, L's over at um, the Adelaide Thunderbirds. Jackie's moved across to the Magpies which I'm sure there's a part of you that's dirty about that she's done the cross-town swap. But do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's something that's come out of that COVID time, extended bench, and then the netball community got to see a whole other range of players who can make a profession for themselves now. Yeah, I think you make a really great point. Being able to carry more players this year meant, and having back-to-back games, I think, meant that more girls got opportunity to show what they can do. And um, I think there's something pretty special about that. The girls were able to get out on court. Coaches were able to see them. And as you say, I don't like to see any players leave the Vixens, but, you know, we've got so much depth here in Victoria. Sometimes we have to let them go for a year or two and then hopefully we can get them back in a couple of years. But there's not many spots. You look at it and you go, there is 10 spots in a team and 80 spots across Australia and we've probably got about 15 imports. So you've got about 65 girls who get to play in our league at the top level and you look at the pool of girls that they're picking from. Um, so I am I get so excited when girls get an opportunity and they can take that, whether it be with the Bixons or with another club because I've been lucky enough to see, you know, Jackie's been within our program for such a long time and, you know, you could see that she was ready and you just sort of... There wasn't a spot for her at Vixens yet. Um, so for her to get an opportunity somewhere else, I'm actually really excited. And as I said, hopefully one day they'll want to come back. But, um, yeah, I, I love that more girls got opportunities this year. Because I guess that's the hard thing. You mentioned about Jackie, that she was ready to play at that level. But, unfortunately, Emily, Jo and KD were there too. Like, it's just so tough and cutthroat, I guess, when you get to that pointy end of the, of the netball pathway. Yeah, our sport is tough. You know, we've got amazing girls who, you know, they're ready to go and they just need an opportunity to show what they can do. And I think the extended squads helped that this year. Um, I, I thought maybe 12 players would stay, but we've, we've gone back to that 10 and hopefully, um, you know, with our rolling subs still, we can see more girls out on court and coaches being able to see what they can do and hopefully we can get more and more girls signed to clubs and, um, yeah, having a real impact in our SSM so you were talking about the flexibility of the diamond shooting end as well as how consistent Caitlin Thwaites, Tegan and MJ were at the Vixens shooting end. Now we've got where we've added Kaylee Stanton and Ruby Barkmeyer um, to the Vixens shooting circle. How do you think that's going to change things for you? Yeah, it does change a lot. You know, um, Katie Thwaites and Teagues have been a big part of the Vixens for such a long time. Um, you know, they've been at, well, I think Teagan was at the club for about 10, 11, 12 years maybe. And Thwaites had been there, gone and come back. And, um, you know, I think the, they had amazing careers. And what's great now is we've got two young girls who could get an opportunity to show what they can do. And Ruby has been in our program and through the Netball Victoria pathway for a few years now. And um, she's had a massive pre-season and I'm really excited about what she can do. And um, Kaylee, obviously coming from Perth as well. Um, you know, yeah, she's been great fitting into our squad and I'm really excited about our shooting circle. And I think it's, um, you know, it's a new challenge for us. Uh, I think it makes us uh, a little bit, uh, you know, it, we're going to be a different side. And so people are going to, they can't just watch footage from last year. We're going to be different and it's going to be exciting. And I hope that they can grab their opportunities and really show everyone what they can do. I'm going to jump on the Ruby Barkmeyer bandwagon pretty early because uh, it was 2018, maybe. I went up to nationals and Ruby was actually an import player for Tasmania um, that year. And she, some goal, I guess, goal attacks it at that level are nervous to put up a shot if they're not in a position where they're comfortable shooting from. But the thing that I noticed about Ruby at that level was anywhere she got the ball in the circle, she would turn and put the shot up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on Ruby's bandwagon nice and early. Um, and I'm really excited to see. It's so cool that you can, you know, um, I guess watch people progress up the pathway and then get to that, that next level. Same with Ali Smith now yep. in the Vixen squad as well. It's really exciting. I think there's something pretty special about netball and might be a little bit different to other sports in like draft systems is, um, you know, for some of us, we get that opportunity to play for our state and, and to continue to represent Victoria or it might be New South Wales or South Australia. I think, you know, there's no better feeling than 
putting on that navy blue dress or whether you get to go represent Australia and pull on that green and gold dress. It, it, it's an amazing feeling. But you're right, Roos is cool, calm and collected. Um, nothing seems to bother her and she'll, she'll shoot the ball from anywhere. I've seen her playing against Joe Weston at training and she's one of the... Uh, you know, there's no better competition than Joe Weston to play against. And she just doesn't seem to be phased by anything. And I, and I love that about her and excited to see what she can bring to our team. Mate, we've come to this point of the podcast where <laughs> I actually haven't given you any prep, which is my own fault, but I ask everyone to make a big call. So, um, you know, Renee Ingalls, friend of yours, Renee's big yep. call was that she likes to snack on frozen peas and corn. That was her big talk. Um, I had, I've recently spoken with, um, you know, Shandor Earl. His big call was chocolate needs to come out of the fridge and not the cupboard. Um, I agree. Smart man. Have you got a big call along those lines? Anything that's a bit controversial that you do? Um, oh. Someone said when they get yogurt out of the fridge, that these are all coming from the fridge. I don't know why, but it doesn't have to be specifically fridge related. <laughs> so, you know, going to the movies by yourself is better than going with someone else. Chicken twi- twisties are better than cheese. Anything you do that's a bit weird that you're like, people go, man, that's not, that's not right. That's a big call. Yeah. I didn't have anything and you got me thinking, but now I do, I need to go grab it. Can I go grab it? Yeah. Yeah. Go, go. I'll be one second. I've got yeah. a little fridge here. Okay. Okay. I'm interested to see. I'm um, coming, Tommy. I'm not far. <laughs> so Kate's just um, wandered off, gone to her fridge in her hotel room. Here we go. I told you I really like avocado toast. Yeah. 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 And so I was lucky enough to be able to do a supermarket shop in and I've got an avocado here and I don't have glad wrap being in quarantine though to wrap it up. So, but I cut my avocados this way rather than... No! Yeah. You can't do that. I think is a bit... Is that different? Yes. That's a big one. I always cut it this way. Why? And I... I know this is a lot of people are just going to be listening to this. I have no idea what I mean. Yeah, so, <laughs> so in, much better. Like so you in, cut the end off and then you just scoop it all out and then you have this end left. Yeah, okay. So, how are we going to explain this? Instead of cutting it vertically, you cut it horizontally. horizontally. Yeah. Okay, because then it's like a cup. That makes sense. Instead of trying to scoop it out of half of it, you've got like a, a cup. Yeah. Okay. Which That's I logical. Think yeah, I think it's pretty fair. But something that I think a lot of people do is cut it vertically. So there's yeah. one thing for me, Tommy. Yeah, a bit of a kitchen hack. Yeah. Man, it's out of the fridge. So now I need to work out if I have anything that's not out of the fridge. <laughs> yeah, I need, to get some big calls. <laughs> I need to get some big calls not fridge related. But um, no, I need to prep my guests better. That's my fault. But, mate, <laughs> Kate, Kate Maloney, over in uh, New Zealand in the quarantine before the uh, Constellation Cup, I really appreciate you giving me some of your time, although I kind of approached the Diamonds meeting manager at the right time because I knew you were all in quarantine. So I'm like, well, one of them's got to talk to me because I've got nothing else to do. We've got plenty of time on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, hopefully I'll be able to catch up with one of you after the first couple of games. But um, good luck for the series against the New Zealand team. And, mate, Kate Maloney, thank you so much for having a chat. Thanks for having me on and giving me something to do during quarantine. But as you said, very excited to play. And yeah, hopefully everyone can switch on to Channel 9 and uh, watch the Diamonds hopefully get a couple of good wins against the Ferns. Also, it's at like five o'clock Australian time, like perfect time. Come home from work, bang. Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, I think the games are over here. But check your local guides. I mean, let's just put that out. I reckon it might be Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. So. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. How are you you going to go back and up after one day? Uh, That's all right. We can do that. We got it, Tommy. (laughs) (laughs) Impressive, mate. Impressive athlete. Kate Maloney, thanks so much for having a chat. Thanks, Tommy. See you later.